Welcome everyone. Today's mini lecture is on the Persian artist Muhammad Zaman and how he integrated European aesthetics with Persian artistic styles. So this is in the medieval Islamic period. The Persians were also known as the Safavids. During this time, there were three major Islamic empires, also known as the Gunpowder Empires because they were created out of war and invasion. To the west was the Ottoman Empire, and to the east is the Mughals, and situated right in the middle in modern-day Iran and Iraq was the Safavids. The Persians were well known for their extensive production in the book arts, particularly manuscript illumination. Artists, poets, poets and calligraphers would copy from famous manuscripts, especially those produced during the reign of Shah Tamasp. So here you can see some of the rulers of the Safavid Persian Empire. Some of the most famous Persian manuscripts were produced during the reign of Shah Tamasp. One of the most famous examples we've already discussed a little bit is the Shah Nameh or the Book of Kings. This is just a single page from the Shah Nameh but is one of the most exquisite and well known. The Safavids were created from the Mongol invasion, so there is a sense of a Chinese influence. We can see this, this in the smoke as well as the use of watercolor. The figures also have almond-shaped eyes, round moon-type faces, and black hair, so these motifs would become a very indicative of Persian art. And this type of imagery was the Persian ideal. We've talked about the ideal bodies desired by Greeks or what the Egyptians would find ideal. And this is the Persian version of what becomes ideal. As part of a long-standing tradition of refurbishing manuscripts, in 1675, Shah Suleiman, so the King Suleiman, initiated a project <clears throat> to revamp one of Tomas' manuscripts known as the Hamza, which is a recreation of one of the foundational texts in Persian literature and is a set of five compositions in verse form by the renowned 12th century poet Nizami Ganjavi. This epic is a story about the life of a Sasanian king named Bahram V. So we've already discussed Bahram V when we talked about the Sasanians and the metal gilded plates used with mercury gilding for the depiction of Sasanian kings. <clears throat> so the story is about his transformation again from a pleasure-seeking prince to a wise and just king. The 16th century paintings from Tomas Hanzo were cut from their supports, repositioned, and given new borders. Illumination, or painting on the manuscript page, was added, and full-page paintings with Europeanized styles were added. By refurbishing this manuscript, Suleiman retained connections with Persian aesthetic traditions while also integrating contemporary artistic ambitions. The artist of these new paintings in the Hamza manuscript was Muhammad Zaman, who was the imperial painter in the court of the Safavid Shah Suleiman. So let's take a look at how he revamped these images, as well as combined different aesthetic influences. We will be focusing on only one of his paintings from the Hamza, titled Turk Tazi and the Queen of the Fairies. It was not as common for Islamic artists to sign their work because manu manuscript production was a collaborative process. You would have a different person as the scribe, another one to paint, one to illuminate or gild the page, one to bind the page, etc. So we do know that Muhammad Zaman is the painter, however, because he does actually sign his name. In this close-up, it reads, In the felicitous city of Ashraf, by the hand of the humblest of servants, Muhammad Zaman, it was finished in the year 1675. This particular style is called Farangazi art. 
So Ferengazi literally means the making of European or Europeani Europeanized styles in late Safavid painting. So this is to show you guys that hybrid art is still going on in this area, in the Near East, even in the medieval period, and continues to do so today. This hybrid style developed by the Safavid artists was developed in the 1630s as a result of Shah Abbas actually allowing Catholic missionaries to settle within and outside the capital city of Isfahan, and this increased trade between Europe and Persia. So the Ferengazi style became a hybrid where artists typically employed European pictorial motifs, such as linear and atmospheric perspective, modeling, and chiaroscuro, combined with Persian motifs of jewel-like colors, careful attention to detail, and realism. So in this scene, Bahram is led to Queen of the Fairies in Turktaz. That is, a fantasy-like garden that is said to be, quote, untouched by the dust of men. So Bahram humbly kisses the ground before her, and the king is offered a place beside Turktaz, or the queen. Surrounding the figures are the queen's maidens who pour wine and entertain the two central figures. So taking a look at this, let's kind of break down what kind of I European styles we have in this image. So firstly, we have a different kind of perspective. This space has become more realistic as far as its depiction. Nature as well is a focus here. Nature imagery is extremely important in the Persian literary tradition. The poet Nizami of the Hamza described the landscape of the Turktazi garden in detail as a place of thick green grass, blossoming trees, and calm waters. Quote, girt by a mount of emerald hue where cypress, pine, and polar grew. As we see the artist's visual presentation effectively translate Nima, Nizami's poetic vision, we can also see that this imagery is comparable to northern European forest landscapes that were circulating through paintings and prints that were brought to Iran through diplomatic and commercial or economic channels. The right image is titled Forest Landscape with Pool from a series composed by an artist named Sadler II in the early 1600s. The similarities lie in the large gnarled tree roots, as well as the contrast of light and dark used to accentuate the foliage but also hint a later time of day or, in Mohammed Zaman's painting, nighttime. We can also observe striking similarities if we compare Muhammad Zaman's painting to traditional Persian painting, such as the image of, from the Shah Nameh. In each of these images, careful attention is paid to each and every single leaf. Take a look, kind of peruse through the landscape scene of Zaman's painting. The attention to specific details is a hallmark of Persian miniature painting, and Zaman integrates both European and Persian styles to create a hybridized aesthetic. What is more unique is that Muhammad Zaman used a Western technique known as Pitera Tenebrosa, or also known as Tenebrism, which is characterized by a dominance of darkness in the picture plane with very few lit areas. Zaman uses light from specific sources, the full moon, as well as the candles and the torches. Tenebrism has many metaphorical uses, but in this case, Zaman employs it cleverly. In Nizami's poem, the queen is repeatedly compared to the moon and the purity of its brilliance. As I mentioned before, the story surrounds the king Bahram, who transitions from a man consumed by worldly desires and becomes a wise king. In this way, Zaman uses moonlight to suggest the queen's spiritual illumination that lights up the entire landscape and the dinner scene versus the king's unbridled passion. The king's desire for the queen is further represented by a small moth that's located just above the candle flame. 
As a moth to the flame, the king cannot help but be seduced by the queen's radiance. So this is a proverbial theme that is not just popular in our culture, but was also used many times in early Persian literature and in Nizami's Hamza. This merging of Eastern and Western artistic styles is especially visible in the facial features and outfit of the Indian princess. The right image is of Queen Henrietta Maria. She was the consort of King Charles I of England, and it is known that in 1638, portraits of the king, queen, and their children were presented to Shah Safi I. So it is suggested that these type of portraits were kept in the Safavid royal treasury, and as a court artist, Muhammad Zaman would have had access to them. But the question is, why would Zaman depict the queen of the fairies as a European woman when the poet Nizami describes her as a Turk? So this is also a interesting kind of psychological take. So in Nizami's poems, the city of Turktaz and the Turkish queen are described in reference to the foreign, meaning that they exist in some kind of faraway place. Here, the main female figure is unveiled and addresses the viewer presenting her beauty. She is shown gesturing invitingly to her male companion as she offers him more wines. Scholars have theorized that the candlesticks and vessels are also phallic shapes that penetrate the space of the figures shown in between the queen and king and in the hands of one of her maidens suggest a theme of sexual delight in which the king engages each night with one of the queen's maidens. So now, whereas Westerners view the East as being exotic and a sort of erotic wonder, and this is a phenomenon that had been going on um, particularly popular in the 19th century, here, the use of the queen, of the English queen, as the Turkish queen of fairies, is essentially eroticizing in on the part of Easterners, where the Eastern view of the West... So, in Nizami's poem, the female Turk embodies desire, which will lead the king into a dangerous state of irrationality. The loss of his wits drives him to return repeatedly to what will ultimately consume him, that being desire. So in this sense, Muhammad Zaman may have associated the otherworldness and eroticism of Nizami's fairy queen from a faraway land with the exoticism and allure of a European woman. Think about, um, as well, if you guys have ever listen to someone that has an accent that you found particularly attractive, maybe Australian, um, Japanese, you know, English, what have you. So it's the same kind of idea here that while we might be more attracted to a particular type of accent, the accent that we have can also be desirable to others. So so let's talk about Bahram Gur, who's sitting beside the queen in this scene. We see him depicted as a handsome figure with fair skin, blue eyes, and a closely trimmed mustache and beard. So these traits bear strong resemblances of Shah Suleiman himself, and may be a pseudo-portrait of the Safavid ruler. Evidence that this is a portrait of the Shah is further supported by the tradition in Persian painting of depicting individual royal personages and allude to contemporary interest again, merging tradition with a sense of innovation. So if it is in fact a representation of the Safavid Shah, this image can be interpreted in two ways. Firstly, as a visual acknowledgement of the cross-cultural relationships between Europe and the Safavid Empire, one where diplomatic events facilitated meetings that would have been celebrated with food and entertainment. On the other hand, this could be a visual warning to Suleiman to resist being seduced or changed by the beauty and strangeness of Europe, and particularly European people. Traditionally, Persian paintings that depicted contemporary kings 
also acted as a kind of metaphorical mirror where the ruler reflects on his own actions of the past and how they might have benefited the empire or possibly endangered it. In addition to showing you guys cross-cultural relationships between Islamic and European worlds in the 17th century Near East, I also wanted to show you how these merging of artistic styles can be viewed in our own backyard. Henry Bradley Plant actually completed the uh, Plant Hotel in 1893, what is now Plant Hall. Um, what An image of what you're seeing here as well is the Vienna World Exposition in 1873. World exhibitions were, actually they still occur, they were displays of culture, art, even people, and technological innovations. The Paris Exposition Universal in 1888 was one that was visited by Plant, and he actually collected artworks from expositions all over the world. He also gained architectural ideas. So if you guys look at this poster, the one on the bottom right, we can see the use of this kind of Islamic architecture at Paris, as well as the photograph taken from uh, one of the structures, we can see the hanging lamps in this uh, rounded arch. So the kind of style that was really popular in the 19th century in America as well as Europe was called the Moorish Revival style. So this is what we see actually in the minarets. The minarets from Sultan Faraj ibn Barkuk funerary complex was made in the 15th century. It's located in Cairo, Egypt. You can also see the similarities from the Abu Dhabi Mosque minarets. Plants Hotel, interestingly, has 13 minarets with crescents on top. The crescent became a symbol of Islam after Mehmet II conquered Constantinople, or what is modern-day Istanbul, in 1453. Interestingly as well, the 13 moons actually correspond with the Islamic calendar. If we take a look at the round, what are called horseshoe arches, we can see the influence coming from the Great Mosque of Cordoba in the south of Spain in the region known as Andalusia. So the repetition of arches as well as the use of colored brick is a prominent theme that we can see on the facade of Plant Hall or the main entrance. We can also see this in the general decoration where Instead of being highly decorated, as we see with this horseshoe arch um, from the Mosque of Cordoba, we can see that it has been Americanized. So it has been uh, kind of stripped of that opulent decoration, made to look a little bit more modern as well, but still using these same kind of shapes. All right, so for next time, we will be learning about the Seljuk dynasty, so the Seljuk Persians are the ones that are before the Safavids, so they kind of take over in the pre-medieval period um, after the Sasanian. So we'll see how they really enjoy Persian culture so much so that they end up adopting it as their own.